Hello, and welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Mike Parker. I'm the instructor for the class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoy this lesson, please feel free to subscribe to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. Let's begin by introducing the key individuals in this lesson. Lehi, he was a prophet called to preach in Jerusalem around 597 BC. Sariah was Lehi's wife and the mother of their four sons. Laman was Lehi and Sariah's eldest son. Lemuel was their second son. Sam was their third son. And Nephi was Lehi and Sariah's fourth and youngest son. He is also the author of the text we are going to study. Laban was a prominent inhabitant of Jerusalem, a relative of Lehi, and custodian of the plates of brass. Zoram was Laban's slave and keeper of the keys of Laban's treasury. And finally, Ishmael. He was a prominent inhabitant of Jerusalem and father of five daughters and at least two sons. The outline of events for this lesson. In chapters one and two of 1 Nephi, God called Lehi to be a prophet. He prophesied in Jerusalem before fleeing into the wilderness with his family. In chapters three through five, we'll read how Lehi's sons returned to Jerusalem to obtain the brass plates from Laban. In chapters six and nine, Nephi describes the records the Lord commanded him to create. And then finally in chapter seven, Lehi's sons returned to Jerusalem again and persuaded Ishmael and his family to join them on their journey. On their way back to Lehi's camp, some of Ishmael's sons and daughters joined Laman and Lemuel in a rebellion against Nephi. The setting for this lesson is the city of Jerusalem and the area just south of it toward the Red Sea, around 597 BC. A little bit of background on what got us to this point. The nation of Judah had been on her own for 125 years. The Assyrian Empire had deported the 10 northern tribes around 721 BC after they rebelled against Assyrian rule. Some northern Israelites escaped south to Judah before the Assyrian removal. Lehi was of the tribe of Manasseh, so his ancestors must have either been refugees from the north or northerners who had settled outside of their tribal homelands before the Assyrian threat. His wealth and the size of his estate seem to indicate the latter. The Assyrian Empire fell to the Babylonians around 612 BC. This created a power vacuum that Egypt and Judah exploited by asserting their independence. The Babylonians put down these rebellions by defeating Egypt in 605 and Judah in 602. Five years later, Judah rebelled again. In response, the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem, plundered the temple, and deported many of the elite and skilled Jews to Babylon. The Babylonians installed Zedekiah of Judah as a puppet ruler. Nephi's story began around 597, during the first year of the reign of Zedekiah. The Lord sent many prophets who warned that Jerusalem would be destroyed if its wicked people did not repent. The Old Testament indicates that the people of Judah persecuted and killed these prophets. These prophets included Jeremiah, who was in prison when Lehi left Jerusalem, and possibly Habakkuk. The heading to 1 Nephi is a translation from the small plates of Nephi, 
and is therefore part of the scriptural text of the Book of Mormon. Nephi wrote the Book of First Nephi around 570 BC, after his family had arrived in the Promised Land, and nearly three decades after the events he described in the book. His record of these events was an abridgment of his father's own record, which we do not have. Nephi's account consisted of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. He was apparently writing in the Hebrew language, but using a modified Egyptian script, probably because this script was more compact than Hebrew characters. Nephi described his father and mother as goodly parents. Lehi knew of the brass plates and was able to read them. His son Nephi was also familiar enough with metallurgy that he was able to identify the quality of Laban's sword and make his own plates from gold ore. These evidences may indicate that Lehi was a metalworker, perhaps one who traveled and traded to support his profession. Lehi's first vision, like many other revelations, came in response to sincere prayer. There appeared a pillar of fire that dwelt upon a rock before Lehi. Israelites called the visible symbol of God's presence the Shekinah. It manifested itself as a fiery pillar. Lehi's vision is comparable to Moses' experience at the burning bush, the glory of the Lord that led Israel in the wilderness and filled the Temple of Solomon, the pillar of light Joseph Smith saw at the commencement of his first vision and other divine manifestations. After receiving this vision, Lehi went home and cast himself on his bed where he had a second vision in the form of a dream. Lehi's vision was a throne theophany. He was taken into heaven where he saw God sitting at the head of his heavenly council. Throne theophanies are very common in ancient and modern scripture. He saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. He then saw one who was the Messiah or Christ. He also saw 12 others. This last reference was clearly to Jesus' apostles or disciples, but which 12 did Lehi see? The 12 apostles from Jesus' New Testament ministry? The 12 Nephite disciples chosen from Lehi's descendants? Or were they symbolic of the 12 in all ages? The text doesn't really tell us. The first of the 12 gave Lehi a scroll to read. It was full of the sins of the people of Jerusalem and their coming destruction. The book symbolizes Lehi being called to prophesy for the Lord. In similar visions had by Ezekiel and John the Revelator, they received books when they were called as prophets by heavenly messengers. As Lehi read the book, he cried out, Woe, woe unto Jerusalem, for I have seen thy abominations. In the Old Testament, a woe is a distinctive form of prophetic speech that is often found accompanying an accusation or threat, which immediately preceded an announcement of judgment. It is an intense outburst of invective directed against wrongdoers, conveying a note of threat, which is then more fully spelled out in the pronouncement that follows. Why did Lehi go from woes as he was reading to rejoicing in God's mercy after he finished reading? possibly because he understood the destruction of Jerusalem in the context of the Lord's larger plan, which included the atonement of Christ. Lehi then had a very brief ministry in Jerusalem. Like the other prophets of his day, the people of Jerusalem tried to kill Lehi because he condemned their sins and their wickedness. Nephi told us the readers not to worry at this point, because he intended to show us through this story that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. He showed the Lord's mercies by describing how the Lord blessed Lehi 
and delivered him from the threats to his life. Nephi explained that the Lord commanded my father, even in a dream, that he should take his family and depart into the wilderness. And it came to pass that he was obedient under the word of the Lord, wherefore he did as the Lord commanded him. The phrase, into the wilderness, was Nephi's subtle way of connecting his family's experience to the experience of Moses, whom the Lord commanded to take the children of Israel three days' journey into the wilderness, that they may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Nephi would make the connection between his own experience and Moses' experience several more times. Nephi concluded this part of his narrative by telling us that his father was obedient unto the word of the Lord. Obedience is also a recurring theme in Nephi's story. Lehi fled Jerusalem and went south into the wilderness of the Arabian Peninsula. He and his family traveled to the shore of the Red Sea and then went an additional three days along the coast to a valley where they offered a sacrifice in thanks to the Lord. Nephi described the place where they stopped as a firm and steadfast valley with a river that was continually running into the Red Sea. Lehi named the river after his eldest son, Laman, and the valley after his second son, Lemuel, in the hopes that doing so would inspire them to be righteous and keep the Lord's commandments. One of the best candidates for the Valley of Lemuel is Wadi Taib al Asim, a narrow, steep canyon in northwestern Arabia that has a river that empties year-round into the Red Sea. It's about three days' journey, 75 miles by camel, if we begin measuring from the southern border of Israel. It's at this point in the narrative that we're introduced to Lehi's two eldest sons, Laman and Lemuel. Nephi repeatedly went out of his way to contrast himself with his two eldest brothers. While Laman and Lemuel knew not the dealings of God, Nephi tells us he had a great desires to know the mysteries of God. Nephi wrote of the hardness of the hearts of his brethren, but he wrote that he prayed and the Lord did soften my heart. I find that statement particularly intriguing. First Nephi chapter two, verse 16, suggests that Nephi's heart was initially not soft, but only became so after Nephi did cry unto the Lord and the Lord did visit him. Was Nephi uncertain at first of his father's claims? If so, what does that tell us about our own struggles with doubt? Nephi's older brothers murmured against their father and would not hearken to their younger brother but Nephi did not rebel against his father. Nephi did, however, convince his older brother Sam to be obedient to their father. It's at this point that the Lord made a covenant with Nephi. From 1 Nephi chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, we read, And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Blessed art thou, Nephi, because of thy faith, for thou hast sought me diligently, with lowliness of heart. And inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper, and shall be led to a land of promise, yea, even a land which I have prepared for you, yea, a land which is choice above all other lands. And inasmuch as thy brethren shall rebel against thee, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. This is the first time that the text of the Book of Mormon makes a connection between obedience and divine blessings. This will be repeated frequently throughout the book. The Lord's promises are conditional upon us making a sincere effort to follow his commandments. As we're going to see, however, when the Lord blesses his people because of their obedience, all too often they stop being obedient. Lehi had another dream in which the Lord commanded him to send his sons back to Jerusalem to retrieve a set of engraved brass plates kept by a man named Laban. Lehi said these plates contained the record of the Jews and also a genealogy of his forefathers. So who was Laban? Nephi didn't tell us much about Laban, but we can surmise from the text that he was a wealthy, politically connected individual. He may have been a military leader. He commanded 50 men, wore armor, and possessed a very expensive sword that seems to have been more ceremonial or decorative than designed primarily for combat. 
Laban was also related to Lehi in some way and kept a history of their extended family on the brass plates. Nephi's response to his father's instructions is one of the most important passages in the Book of Mormon. I've formatted this portion of the text so you can see its parallel poetic structure. The passage is chiastic in the pattern of A, B, C, C prime, B prime, A prime. The concepts in each line are repeated in the matching line. I've underlined them so you can identify them more easily. First Nephi chapter three, verses seven through eight. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, said unto my father, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. And it came to pass that when my father had heard these words, he was exceedingly glad, for he knew that I had been blessed of the Lord. It isn't just Nephi's obedience that's important here. It's also his teaching that the Lord does not give us commandments unless he prepares a way for us to accomplish them. For if it so be that the children of men keep the commandments of God, he doth nourish them and strengthen them and provide means whereby they can accomplish the thing which he has commanded them. That's 1 Nephi 17.3. It wasn't Nephi's strength that was important, but his willingness to follow the Lord. We should trust in the Lord's power and grace and not our own abilities. Nephi and his brothers returned to Jerusalem and attempted to obtain the brass plates. Laman made the first attempt. He went to Laban and asked him for the plates. Laban called him a robber and threatened to kill him. Nephi's brothers were ready to quit after just one try. Nephi, at this point, gave his first exhortation to his brothers. This is in chapter 3, verses 15 through 21. He began by telling them, As the Lord liveth, and as we live, we will not go down unto our father in the wilderness until we have accomplished the thing which the Lord hath commanded us. Wherefore, let us be faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Nephi's wording, as the Lord liveth and as we live, was a most solemn oath. Anciently, a person would rather die than violate an oath that invoked the life of the Lord as well as his own life. Nephi's concern that they preserve the words of the prophets will be borne out when we learn about the people of Zarahemla. They lost both their language and their faith because they brought no sacred records with them to the promised land. The brothers then made their second attempt. They returned to their abandoned home, collected their father's wealth, returned to Jerusalem, and tried to exchange their possessions for the plates. Laban seized their property, kicked them out, and sent his slaves to kill them. The brothers fled from the city and hid in a cave, where Laman and Lemuel began to speak many hard words unto us, their younger brothers, and they did smite us even with a rod. An angel then appeared and rebuked Nephi's brothers. The angel told Laman and Lemuel that the Lord hath chosen Nephi to be a ruler over you because of your iniquities. This would be a reversal of the typical family structure in the ancient Near East, where the oldest brother held authority over the younger ones. Nephi then gave them his second exhortation. This is in chapter 3, verse 31 through chapter 4, verse 3. He responded to his brother's complaint that Laban can command 50, yea, even he can slay 50, then why not us? By exhorting them to trust in the Lord, who is mightier than Laban and his 50, yea, or even his tens of thousands. He used the same imperative that he used in his first exhortation, let us be faithful. Nephi again invoked the example of Moses in urging his brothers to trust that the Lord would deliver them. Acting alone, Nephi made a third attempt to obtain the plates. And I was led by the Spirit, he wrote, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. Making his way through the streets of Jerusalem at night, Nephi happened upon Laban, who was passed out from intoxication. 
This is one of the most difficult stories in all of scripture. When he wrote his story, Nephi himself knew his readers would be concerned about the morality of his actions, and he wanted them to understand that what he did was justified. The Spirit of the Lord urged Nephi to kill Laban. Nephi recoiled at this and repeatedly refused because he knew the seriousness of what he was being asked to do. The Spirit of the Lord justified Nephi's act on six bases. First, the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. Second, Laban had sought to take away mine own life. Third, Laban would not hearken unto the commandments of the Lord. Fourth, Laban had also taken away our property. Fifth, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. And sixth, it is better that one man should perish than a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. Nephi further rationalized that his descendants could not keep the commandments of the Lord according to the law of Moses, save they should have the law which was on the plates. Therefore, the Lord had delivered Laban into my hands. John W. Welch, a prominent Book of Mormon scholar and retired law professor at Brigham Young University, has argued that, according to the law of Moses and the cultural expectations of the time, Nephi was legally within his rights to slay Laban. Nephi's act would have been considered protected manslaughter, not murder. Laban had tried to kill Nephi and his brothers, so the law at that time gave Nephi the right to execute him. The cultural expectations of Nephi's world were vastly different than our own. Hugh Nibley enjoyed telling a story about his Arab students in the early 1950s who were required to take the basic Book of Mormon class at Brigham Young University. Knowing that the Laban episode had been troublesome to the moral sensitivities of many 20th century readers, Nibley was puzzled when these students found the story somewhat implausible, but precisely for the opposite reason he had expected. Instead of being troubled that Nephi had killed the unconscious Laban, the students found it odd that he had hesitated so long. Nephi cut off Laban's head with Laban's own sword. He then dressed in Laban's clothing and armor and went to Laban's house. There he encountered Zoram, Laban's slave. Pretending to be Laban, Nephi directed Zoram to retrieve the brass plates from the treasury and go with him outside the city walls. When Nephi met up with his brothers, Zoram recognized that he had been deceived he was about to make a run for it back to his master's house, but Nephi restrained him and swore a most solemn oath, as the Lord liveth and as I live, that he would be a free man if he would go with them into the wilderness. Zoram responded with his own oath that he would stay with them, after which the brothers' fear did cease concerning him. Nephi used his mother Sariah as an example of contrasting attitudes. We've previously seen how Nephi contrasted his attitude with the attitudes of Laman and Lemuel. In the passage at the beginning of chapter 5, he showed how his own mother at first doubted, but then came to have faith. Her sons must have been away longer than she had expected, for she believed they had died in the wilderness. She blamed her husband Lehi for their deaths, sarcastically calling him a visionary man, and accusing him of leading them away from their lands of inheritance. These were the same accusations Laman and Lemuel had made against their father when they had first left Jerusalem. Lehi responded to his wife by affirming that, yes, he was a visionary man, in the positive sense, and that the Lord had given them a better land to inherit. When her sons returned safely and successfully, Sariah was consoled and she testified in ancient poetic form. This is from 1 Nephi chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. And when we had returned to the tent of my father, behold, their joy was full, and my mother was comforted. And she spake, saying, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath commanded my husband to flee into the wilderness. Yea, and I also know of a surety that the Lord hath protected my sons and delivered them out of the hands of Laban and given them power whereby they could accomplish the thing which the Lord hath commanded them. And after this manner of language did she speak. And it came to pass that they did rejoice exceedingly 
and did offer sacrifice and burnt offerings unto the Lord, and they gave thanks unto the God of Israel. Nephi had previously obtained a witness of the truth of his father's claims. Now Sariah had gained her own personal testimony of her husband's prophetic calling. Like Sariah, we should expect that our faith and patience will be tested before we obtain such a witness. Lehi examined the brass plates. He discovered they contained, first, the five books of Moses, including an account of the creation of the world and the fall of Adam. Second, a record of the Jews from the beginning, even down to the commencement of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, the time in which Lehi lived. Third, the prophecies of the holy prophets from the beginning down to Lehi's time. These included at least some writings of the prophet Isaiah, many prophecies of Jeremiah, and the writings of some prophets that are not found in our Old Testament, including Zenos and Zenok. Fourth, Lehi's family genealogy, through which he verified that he was a descendant of Joseph, the grandson of Abraham, who was sold into Egypt. Lehi prophesied about the brass plates. He said that they should go forth unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people who were of his seed, and they should never perish, neither should they be dimmed any more by time. We don't have the brass plates, but we do have much of the material that was on them by way of the Old Testament and the Book of Mormon. Lehi testified that these plates were of great worth unto his family, insomuch that we could preserve the commandments of the Lord unto our children. In chapter 6 and chapter 9, Nephi described his own records. Nephi's record on the small plates contained only a brief account of his father's doings. For, he wrote, I desire the room that I may write the things of God. For the fullness of mine intent is that I may persuade men to come unto the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and be saved. Nephi received a commandment of the Lord to create the small plates, to record the ministry of his people. His large plates contained an account of the reign of the kings and the wars and contentions of his people. The Lord then commanded Lehi that his sons should take daughters to wife, that they might raise up seed unto the Lord in the land of promise. To accomplish this, the Lord directed that Ishmael and his family should join them. Nephi and his brothers returned to Jerusalem again. Note that Laman and Lemuel did not complain this time. When Ishmael heard the message brought to him by Lehi's sons, the Lord softened his heart, and he took his family into the wilderness to join Lehi. There's an interesting textual problem in 1 Nephi chapter 7, verse 5. The original manuscript of the Book of Mormon reads, The Lord did soften the heart of Ishmael, and also his whole whole. When Oliver Cowdery copied this passage onto the printer's manuscript, he wrote, and also his household, which has been the reading in every printed edition of the Book of Mormon. It seems likely, however, that Joseph Smith dictated, and also his whole household, and this should be the reading in this verse. On the journey to Lehi's camp, Laman and Lemuel and some of Ishmael's family rebelled against Nephi. They wanted to go back to Jerusalem. Nephi reiterated to them everything he had taught and everything they had seen and experienced up to this point. Nephi's brothers became even more angry and tied him up, but Nephi exercised his faith and his bonds were miraculously released. Some of Ishmael's family pleaded with Laman and Lemuel. The brothers' hearts were softened and they asked for Nephi's forgiveness. Nephi freely forgave them. When the party arrived at Lehi's tent, they all gave thanks again unto the Lord. That concludes this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button to give it a like and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download the notes and slideshow for this lesson. Next week, we'll study Lehi's vision of the Tree of Life and Nephi's Apocalypse. The reading is 1 Nephi chapter 8 
and chapters 10 through 15. Thanks again for joining me.